Hi, I'm Mathieu from Shapediver. Welcome back to the Shapediver tutorials. You're watching the second episode currently, so if you missed the first one, make sure to check it out first. Unless you're already comfortable with the basics, of course. In this second episode, I'll focus on materials and rendering. So we saw in the last episode that any piece of geometry from the Grasshopper canvas, for example, this box, will be displayed in Shapediver. But if you only use the standard components, the objects will get the same basic white materials once they're online, so like this one, for example, um, because no custom material has been specified. So let's have a look at the tools we have in Grasshopper to customize materials. And there's several ways to do so, which is going to be the occasion to introduce the ShapeDiver plugin today. But first, as I mentioned last time, uh, it was one of our goals uh, when we created ShapeDiver to make it compatible with standard Grasshopper tools. And in this case, Grasshopper does provide uh, a set of components to, to define and assign materials. Uh, so if you go to the display tab, you can use the custom preview components and connect it to any uh, piece of geometry on the canvas and it will assign a material to it. By default, this material is this pink, but I can use the create material component and customize uh, the material that I assign to it according to the standard Rhino materials with a diffuse specular emissive lighting model. So here, now I can uh, try to upload this model. Don't forget to hide everything that we don't want to show. So I'm only showing the preview in this case. I'm saving the file and I'll try to upload it. All right, cube with materials. All right, so if, if I didn't do any mistake, it will uh, produce the expected results being our cube with a color swatch uh, that I can use to customize the material of the cube. And that's it. So we provide um, a preview of how the objects will look like on Shapediver, but obviously the, the rendering engine is very different, so this preview can be approximative sometimes. All right, so those components are a good way to start tweaking the looks of your online models, but they are limited in at least two ways. Uh, first, they don't allow the use of textures, so you can't uh, get textured models online with just custom preview. And the second thing is, in general, uh, our online viewer makes use of PBR shaders um, uh, using the metalness roughness lighting model. And these components obviously can't exploit the, the full potential of, of these materials. So that's why it's finally time to take it to the next level and use the ShapeDiver plugin for Grasshopper. So if you didn't do it already, you can head to Food for Rhino and you'll find the plugin there. Make sure you always get the latest version. Currently, it's version 1.6. Uh, if you're on Windows, you can use the installer. Uh, with Mac, it's lagging behind a bit, but you have uh, an archive version of the plugin that you can also uh, install. Uh, and once you have installed the plugin, you will see it as expected in the toolbar. And we'll go over all the tools in several tutorials. Uh, for today, I will stick to the uh, components that are uh, related to uh, display and texturing. So essentially, the display group contains components which work in a similar way uh, than create material and custom preview. So the equivalent of custom preview is the ShapeDiver display geometry component. So I can, I can use it instead here. I'll also remove this one. Uh, and the material is created using the ShapeDiver material component. Pretty self-explanatory. And I use them in pretty much the same way. So I'm going to connect my box to the display geometry component. And I'm connect the material to the second input. And here we see that we have a different set of inputs that correspond to the PBR shaders uh, that we use online. 
Uh, but the first one, name color, is pretty much the equivalent of the diffuse color, so the main color of the material. So here I have I end up with a definition that is exactly equivalent uh, to the ones that I had created with the custom preview component. And if I upload it, I'll get exactly the same result. Now let's look at the other parameters of this component. And the next one is the one that allows you to set the texture to the object. So there's two ways essentially to define a texture. The first one is to use an external URL. So color and I use a text panel and now I can go online and look for uh, let's say a metal texture for example. First one. I can use the URL of this image, set it in a text panel and connect it to the texture parameter. And that's it. Oh, so here there's several problems. The first one is that the box doesn't define texture coordinates, so I have either to convert it to something else. Or if I mesh it by default, it's going to create some texture coordinates. So here we go. Now I can see the texture. And the second thing is that the display component will uh, complain a little bit because there's some uh, restrictions to the files that you're supposed to use. Uh, in, in WebGL, uh, the first one is that it shouldn't be it should be squared, and the second one is that um, on top of that it should be a power of two in terms of size, so 64, 128, 256, uh, etc. So uh, it's not really a problem if uh, the image doesn't uh, follow these requirements. Uh, our servers will reprocess it, but in terms of performance, it's better if if the image already follows uh, the rules. Anyways, it works uh, as expected. And now if I upload this file, we should see uh, the texture applied correctly to the image. So what happens is that our servers will um, pull the image from the URL and store it with the model. So it's gonna be cached with the model. And even if the if the URL is broken in the future, um, it's still going to work within uh, the uploaded model. So here we go, we have our texture defined on the cube. And now, of course, if I really want metal, I would have to add a little bit of metalness to the object. So that's the next parameter. Um, but first, I'd like to look at the second way to define the texture, which is to internalize it inside the definition. So there's no way to work with bitmaps or internalize bitmaps in the standard Grasshopper components. But if you install the Shader plugin, you'll find that in the list of primitives, there's a new one called bitmap, and that's exactly what we need now. So you can right-click, set one Grasshopper bitmap, and you can choose a local file. So here, I forgot to do that. I have to um, well, save this image, for example. And then I can go here, set one, and pick the image I just downloaded. And here it is. So it's by default, it's going to be internalized when you do that. And then it's part of your Grasshopper definition, so you don't need to reference an external URL. You can directly connect it, and there you go. There's very few tools in Grasshopper to play with texture coordinates, um, so we'll have to look at other plugins if we want to tweak a little bit the, the texture mapping. Uh, the first thing we do is that we support uh, the human plugin, which has this set of uh, texture mapping components. So with using them, you can define uh, a UV space from scratch uh, on any mesh in your definition. Uh, you can use some standard mappings like box, cylinder, uh, spherical. Or if you want to get your hands dirty, you can even define a completely custom mapping. So define each UV for each vertex of a mesh. So that's really useful. Uh, but a bit advanced, what we have in our plugin is um, more components to use existing texture coordinates. So most of the primitives, in, in geometry primitives in, in 
right now. Come with texture coordinates when you, when you build them, and what you want sometimes is just to uh, modify them, uh, adapt them a little bit. So in our case, we can look at the most fundamental component here, which is the texture transform. You input a mesh and uh, mainly uh, a transformation that you want to apply to the UV space. So not to the mesh itself, but to the set of texture coordinates on it. Uh, so, for example, if we want to scale the texture coordinates, we're going to add a scaling transformation. And let's say we want to scale in the U direction, so X maps to U here and Y maps to, uh, maps to V. And we're going to connect the transformation to this component. And here I can scale my texture in one direction, the U direction. If I connect the slider to both X and Y here, it's going to do a uniform scaling over all the faces. So that's a pretty useful way to adapt quickly the existing texture coordinates of a mesh. So now that we know how to play with textures in Grasshopper, we can look at the rest of the parameters in the shape diver materials. So as I mentioned, these parameters correspond to the PBR maps and, and parameters that we use in the online viewer. So if you're familiar with uh, those materials, then you know what I'm talking about. Metalness, roughness, bump map, normal map, opacity map. They can all be defined using textures, so in the same way, either by referencing a URL or internalizing a bitmap in your definition. But on top of that, the metalness, roughness, and opacity uh, parameters can also be defined by a uniform uh, parameters and that's going to define the value over the entire object. So here what I like to do is to always keep room for playing online because since those materials are different from the Rhino materials we can't always provide an accurate um, preview uh, especially for example the normal map we don't even show it uh, when you're in Grasshopper so you'll only see it after you upload the model uh, on Shape Library. So it's always good to keep some room for playing with parameters and, and tweaking them and get a good result once the model is online. So for example, here I'm going to just keep those three and upload the file again, which I already did. That's the magic of editing. And here we are with our model and we can play with metalness, uh, roughness, opacity and, and achieve the, the result we want. And of course, a lot of the viewer settings, uh, environments, and all of this will have a strong uh, impact here. But this is a topic we'll cover uh, in the future. So one last point I wanted to cover today is uh, our, the other way to define materials using our plugin, which is the ShapeDiver Simple Material. So all of these parameters, especially if you're not familiar with them, can uh, be a bit confusing. So we provide uh, a more straightforward way to define a material fast in, in Grasshopper, uh, which is the simple material component. And it only takes a color, so just like the, the full material component, and a preset. Right. So there's a lot of presets that we have, and actually you can check out online this demo model that, that I'm going to link to in the description, uh, which lists all the existing presets that we have so far, and this list is always growing. And then you can see if you can use any of those for your models. So they go from uh, various plastic and metal um, presets, used metal, uh, shiny, gold, used gold, uh, and several types of wood as well, so oak, um, then leather, fabric, so there's really a lot of, uh, of presets to play with here, and sometimes, at least for the pro prototyping phase of your model, they can give already good results uh, regarding your application. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Um, and I'll see you next time for the next tutorial, which will cover more tools from the ShapeDiver plugin, uh, in particular the inputs and outputs you can define in order to uh, 
interact with external files and export files from your definitions. Thanks again and see you next time.